It was October 3rd of 2012. I was on my period. I had run out of my tampons, so I went down to the local store and I bought a new box. I came back upstairs, I changed my tampon. I started feeling a little off. I had to go with my friend's birthday that night. So I was laying in bed and I was texting with my friends. I said, I feel a little weird. I, I don't feel like myself. It was October, it was flu season, a lot of my other friends were sick with the flu, so I just thought maybe I caught the bug. The afternoon came about, I changed my tampon again. I then started feeling even worse. I texted with them again, saying I don't know if I can go tonight, I'm gonna try. But it was my best friend's birthday, so I thought I could, you know, man up and go. That evening, I took a shower, I changed my tampon again, I drove myself to my friend's birthday. As soon as I walked in the door, every single person looked at me and said, wow, you look horrible. At that moment, it felt as though a train had just hit me. I felt everything just at one time, and I felt so sick. I knew I needed to go home and go to my bed. I drove myself back to my apartment. I wanted all of my clothes off because I was extremely hot. I fell into my bed, I went to sleep. My mother and I are best friends. We talk every single day of every moment. She didn't hear from me. She, at that time, had just had surgery, was bedridden about an hour and a half from where I was. She was concerned, called the police, called them to have a welfare check done. The only thing I remember is my blind cocker spaniel jumping on my chest, ferociously barking at me, trying to get me to come too. I was delusional. I was like, what's going on? She was barking, barking, barking. I heard the knocking at the door. Police, police, open up. I thought, why are the police here? I was so confused. I threw on a hoodie. I carried myself to the door. It was one officer. He came inside my apartment. He looked around my apartment. He said, you're really sick. I said, yes. He said, your mom is very worried about you. You should call her. I said, OK. In that moment, the police officer just left. I then carried myself back to my bed. I called my mother. She was frantic. She said, are you okay? I said, I'm just really sick. She said, well, do you need an ambulance? I said, well, the cop just left, so I'll see you in the morning. Well, that being said, no one heard from me. My mom then had someone drive her to my apartment, called the police to come again, called for all of my friends to meet at my place. It took officers 30 minutes to get inside my apartment. They found me face down on my bedroom floor. I had developed 107 fever. My kidneys, my organs were failing. They rushed me to the emergency room. Doctors there wondering what's going on. I had a massive heart attack. Why is this 24-year-old girl healthy, active, in great shape, dying right before our eyes? What's going on? Thank God there wasn't a doctor, an infectious disease doctor on call. He said, well, does she have a tampon in? As soon as they found the tampon and they sent it off to the lab, it came back as TSS-1, toxic shock syndrome. After that, the doctors placed me in a medically induced coma and on life support. The doctors told my mother to plan my funeral, that there was no way that I was coming out of this. I woke up a week and a half later from the medically induced coma. I was ballooned up to 200 pounds. My feet were in excruciating pain. It felt as though someone was sitting there and lighting my feet on fire constantly. I had no idea what was going on. I had no idea what had happened. I saw my mother. There was tubes everywhere. I was very confused. I looked outside. I thought I was in Texas, but really I was in Santa Monica, California. They wanted to get me to UCLA as fast as possible because there is a hyperbaric chamber, which is basically 200% oxygen, which will allow all the blood to go to the necessities of where the blood needs to go to get the organs and everything flowing, my ligaments, everything. I remember as they were trying to figure out and trying to get me moved, there was a nurse. I was alone in my room for the very first time. I always had my mother next to me, I always had someone in the room. A nurse was on the phone to UCLA. She stood behind a curtain on the phone saying, I have a 24-year-old girl here who's going to need a right leg below the knee amputation. I was screamed. I can't even tell you the feeling of knowing that she was speaking about me. 
how could this happen? How could I lose my mobility? How can I lose my legs? There's no way. They rushed me to UCLA. I was there for about two months, in and out of the hyperbaric chamber, two, three hours a day, trying to get my legs to come back. Gangrene had set in, which is very deadly. It could spread to your heart really fast. It was moving further and further up my leg, and they told me that I needed to amputate, and amputate fast. My left foot was really severely damaged as well. My toes, my heel. Doctors gave me a 50-50 chance that I would ever be able to walk and be functional again. They told me to amputate, and I said no, because I believed in God. I, I had faith that somehow he would make this okay. Somehow I had my whole leg. I wouldn't have toes, and my heel would forever be who knows what was going to happen, but I had faith that he would, he, would make it, he would make it work. So, I had the amputation. I then went to another rehab center. In total, I spent four months in the hospital. They had to shave my head because of all the commotion, obviously. No one cared about my hair, they cared about my life. I was 200 pounds. I had no right leg, and my left foot was completely open. And we didn't know what was going to happen. I was then sent home in a wheelchair for eight months, back into a society where I had no idea who I was. My whole identity of everyone, everything I knew about myself was completely stripped. I was sent back into my room. These four walls became my prison. I pushed every single person I could away from me. My mother, my family, I was so ashamed. Who am I? What am I going to do? Everything I knew was perfection, was beauty. I wasn't that anymore. There were so many days that I wanted to end my life. So many days that I, I was trying to figure out how can I kill myself? How can I get out of this misery, this prison that I felt? And at the time, my brother was 14, and he was the first to come home from school every single day. I knew that if I had killed myself, he was going to be the one to find me. I couldn't do that to him. I couldn't do that to my mother. I couldn't allow myself to give in. I had to show him that no matter what happens in life, no matter the worst situation, the darkest of times, you have to get up. You have to fight. I wanted to show him that anything is possible. At that time, I had got an email from a girl named Jennifer Rovero. She happened to be a photographer. She was the only thing that Basically, I felt safe talking to because we knew each other, but we weren't very close. At the time, I lied and said that I was in New York modeling, everything was okay. But really, I was in my bedroom trying not to kill myself. We fell in love over the phone, developed a relationship. I wasn't walking at the time, I was still in my wheelchair. I had a prosthetic sitting in front of me. I hated it. I said, how could this become me? How am I going to become myself with this prosthetic leg? This is not who I am. This thing is just so plastic and, and just not a real leg. I, I, it wasn't me. So, as months go on, I used her as my motivation. I kept going into physical therapy, trying to learn how to walk, so that way I could walk up to her front door and she could see me for me and not for what happened, not because I don't have a leg and half of a foot. I got to her place. I told her what happened, and of course, she gave me open arms with love. Four months of the romantic stage, obviously the depression was still there. I began to have PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder, because of all the traumatic things that were happening to me. She knew that she had to set a fire in me, otherwise I was going to end my life. We then laid in bed and did research. We found a website called youareloved.org. It's basically a website that this woman named Lisa Elferitz had made. She had lost her daughter to TSS in 2010. She was only 16. Once I read all of these little girls' stories who have either died or it's their mothers writing their stories, trying to save other little girls and informing them of the dangers of tampons, I knew that I had to stand up. I had to share this with the world, that I wasn't the only one. I was just the one that got away. We continued our research into TSS, and we came across a congresswoman. Her name is Carolyn Maloney. She's out of New York City. She's gone in front of Congress trying to pass a bill called the Robin Danielson Act. And this bill is named after a woman who died of toxic shock syndrome in 1998. The bill is just basically for us as women to know what's going in our feminine hygiene products and what the long-term effects it will have on our bodies. It's been rejected by Congress nine times. 
So we said, all right, we got to share my story. We have to tell the world. Jennifer, being an amazing photographer, had the idea of me standing in shorts. We wanted to release the story of Vice, and we knew we had to share a powerful, informative, but a different survival story, not a pity party, but of a strong woman standing there trying to stand up for other women, trying to save as many lives as possible. Whether you're a man or a woman, you always have a woman in your life. We released the story with Vice. I stood there for the first time in shorts, revealing myself to the world, this new me. It was one of Vice's biggest stories of 2015, reaching six million views. From then, we got a call from Nordstrom. They wanted me to be a part of their famous holiday catalog. They flew me to New York City. I was so scared, I didn't know what I was going to be doing. It was holiday. Was it dresses? Was it heels? How would my left foot feel in the shoes? How, how was I going to be able to, to shoot? Was I going to be able to, to, to do well? I had no idea. I was so scared. They welcomed me with open arms. They wanted me to shoot for their active wear, giving my prosthetic its very own page, highlighting my disability, highlighting something that I thought I was ashamed of, showing a different side of beauty. Then in February of 2016, I graced the runways for the very first time, debuting myself for a brand named Chromat. It wasn't a typical runway show, showing very voluptuous women, transgender women, but also showcasing me, an amputee, showing you a different side of beauty, celebrating us. Then I got a call from Kenneth Cole in New York City. He had wanted me to be a part of his courageous class. This was everywhere. Every subway, I would walk on the subways, I would see myself, other amputees taking pictures. It was amazing. I was celebrated. Everyone would see me on the street and say, hey, you're the girl from the subway. So much love, so much respect. It was overwhelming. I leave the stage today not only to inform you of a huge women's health issue that we all need to stand up for, but also to show you that no matter what happens in life, no matter what hole you're in, no matter what darkness you're at in your moments in life, there's always an out. And don't let it define you. I am living proof that anything and everything is possible. Thank you.